what does it mean if we're trying to decolonize or be decolonial in our research uh, approaches? What does that mean for the way we write up our research and what does it mean for representation uh, within our research? So each of the sessions has been convened by a group of people from within the Southwest Doctoral Training Partnership. And that's a partnership of five universities, the University of Exeter, Plymouth, Bristol, Bath, and the University of West of England. Um, and the convening team is really very broadly representative of, of our doctoral training partnership. So uh, we have uh, Deborah Brewis, for, who is a lecturer in the university at the University of Bath um, in the School of Management. So, uh, and uh, Dr. Ziba Nwako, who is a postdoctoral scholar in the School of Education at the University of Bristol in the Centre for Innovation and also in the Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Bristol, which is part of our Faculty of Arts. And Suzanne Van Even, who is a doctoral researcher at the University of West of England in the Department for Health and Social Sciences. I didn't introduce myself. Um, my name is uh, Angeline Barrett, and I am the Deputy Director of the Southwest Doctoral Training Partnership. So I've been the overall convener for the series, but I don't do very much in most of the seminars. And I'm going to hand over to the convening team now who will introduce the speakers and uh, explain how the, how the seminar will be organised today. Hey, welcome everybody. Um, one key element of decolonial research is concerned with recentering the stories and knowledge of those who have been and continue to be marginalized through colonialism and ongoing colonial logics. And decolonial research can play a vital role in charting the lasting effects of coloniality in the contemporary world. And this work, as you may have come, you know, encountered already, is not easily done within the confines of established forms of academic writing that were built from and for global elites um, of the global Northwest. Mm -hmm. And so we must approach the development of knowledge from within the academy with reflexivity and care and a deeply critical eye. So questions about how we approach the representation of people, the histories, identities are therefore central as part of how we conduct and convey our research. Participative methodologies and research linked to activism can call for collaborative writing, creative writing, or forms of representation other than writing, which may sit uneasily alongside traditional models um, of the doctorate and academic writing and publishing more generally. So our guests today that we've curated um, to come and speak with us explore questions of representation, authority and authorship, and to explore forms of writing and communicating research mm -hmm. that seek to disrupt the coloniality um, of academic practices that we find mm -hmm. ourselves engaged with. So our programme for today is really exciting, and this is how we're going to spend the next couple of hours together. We've got four guest speakers who will talk for about 10 minutes each. And speakers, I'll give you a little wave on screen when you've got about two minutes left. Um, and <coughs> then, yeah, and then what we're going to do is head straight into some small breakout rooms to generate reflections, comments, and questions about what we've um, heard and what has been shared with us. Uh, and then we're going to return um, and put some of these to our panel of speakers. I've got a Padlet set up, um, which I'll share the link in the chat to now that you can jot down your comments, reflections, and questions, and which the panel speakers will be able to look at in real time and gather their thoughts for our dialogue together at the end. So I hope that sounds all right for everybody. Do make use of the chat to discuss ideas, share questions as we go along. And Ziba and Suzanne are very kindly going to be on the lookout for those as we go through and we'll feed them through into the discussion later. So our first speaker who will be joining us is Dr. Sadvi Da, who is based at Queen Mary University, London. And Sadvi's research has contributed to understanding measurement and culture, uh, processes of knowledge production, governance and accountability structures, all, with, 
always with a focus on voices that are marginalized or muted in institutions. She draws on artistic methodologies in both writing and teaching. And Dr. Dar is one of the five women who founded Building the Anti-Racist Classroom Collective, known as BARC, to develop and promote anti-racist practices in our learning environments. So I'll hand over to you, Sadly. Thank you. Um, just want to first say um, heartfelt thanks for this invitation and to be part of uh, this panel um, composed of some powerful voices um, and um, um, some, some provocative voices as well that, that I'm looking forward to engaging with. Um, Deborah, thank you so much for, for that introduction. That's, that's a wonderful sort of platform, a, a jumping off point for me to talk a little bit about um, decolonizing writing and representation. And um, like you, I, I want to begin by mm -hmm. setting the conditions mm -hmm. of our, our discussions as, as an academic, mm -hmm. um, there is a problem already arising with uh, my positioning as someone who's interested in decolonizing because the very conditions and parameters of my work, the knowledge that has informed my imagination, uh, my capacity to think uh, in boundaries and outside of them is inherently connected with a project that has torn out vast volumes and pages of history of the universe and the world. And so I am already complicit in a uh, institution and set of practices, which uh, I need to take account of as I uh, uh, try to resist those as well. Um, decolonial writing for me uh, is a, uh, is, is a project, a politics, which uh, draws on experiences of working with theory, but also needs to be held to account by practice, practices of collaboration, uh, collectivization, and specifically anti-capitalist uh, practices that guard against the singularity of academic writing as it appears as a succinct rational narrative form with a beginning, a middle, and a very comprehensive conclusion. So if decolonizing is a politics and, and not a process, um, it is then against the project of linearity, the compression of time and its edges uh, and how these compress our capacity to imagine and form knowledge that can resist or challenge uh, the objectivity that Eurocentricity and the Enlightenment project uh, pulls us towards through our work and the way we relate to, to each other. So in this sense, decolonizing is a, uh, a move towards working with tension Decolonizing is to work for the potential of fracture, fracture to, to uh, uh, break apart uh, Eurocentric and capitalist forms of knowledge. And this is therefore a project uh, uh, that we undertake mm -hmm. in a structure that is containing us, but we must work against this structure through our writing to unhinge it somewhat. So the project is uncomfortable. Uh, writing decoloniality de is a risk. It may not always uh, be heard and it may not always be written or authored in a way that is uh, informed by this decolonial politics. But, but it, is, it, is a, uh, it has the potential, I think, for some important uh, and necessary departures um, I think in terms of decolonial writing, uh, at least the way that I have tried to write uh, has been based on lived experiences, lived experiences that give rise 
uh, and acknowledge the tensions between racialized and gendered bodies. Uh, and for letting those tensions inform the way that writing can also bring about tensions uh, and dissonance between forms of knowledge. Um, and I'm very grateful for some of the reading uh, that was provided uh, for today's session to include a paper that I wrote uh, called The Mask of Blackness. Um, and The Mask of Blackness was written as a play, uh, but it was also written as a revisionist play using um, the, the uh, the title and the, gen the, the kind of general plot line of a Jacobean uh, uh, play uh, written at a time very early on in the 17th century where colonialism was beginning to be imagined in racist and racialized uh, and gendered terms. And it would inform centuries of um, um, uh, destruction, violence and, and genocide. Uh, and extraction. And this revisionist play I write, trying to uh, uh, um, mimic uh, the, the tenor and the tone of this form of writing, but also to write against it through the use of footnotes. And the footnotes appear uh, as um, a plethora, I would say, an ephemera of thinking pieces. Some are academic, uh, but others are interviews, some are statistics, some are reflections. Um, and this was done intentionally and consciously to try to disrupt this idea of us uh, being able to provide a concise account, an account that can be comprehensive um, in, in, its, in its form um, and in its contents. So that paper in a way is both a fragment internally fragmented, but it also brings together different forms of knowledge that form some sort of ecology, some sort of accountability to the way that any account is always partial. Um, moving on from, from that paper, uh, what I think uh, uh, helped me to, um, to pursue that line of thinking and that kind of politics in my writing has been collaborative work. Um, and um, uh, very intentionally since 2018, um, I have worked or rather integrated collaborative writing and collaborative and collective politics in the way that I am uh, giving an account of knowledge, uh, giving an account of a theoretical, ontological, or epistemological position. And, and I think this collective and collaborative work speaks to the, the idea of representation that you've highlighted in your session today. Um, here, um, my work with the Decolonizing Alliance uh, is important. Um, it, uh, the Decolonizing Alliance is uh, a group of scholars from the Global North and the Global South, uh, uh, people of color, global majorities, working together to test the limits of collaboration and to um, work with the sharp edges of our embodied knowledge and, his and histories. Um, this collaboration has led to a few of us, about nine or ten of us, forming a, a smaller, tighter group um, uh, committed to writing and to um, thinking also about the possibilities of publishing this writing, uh, uh, if, it, if it can actually uh, appear um, in a public form, uh, which is... is is still um, working against academic norms of receiving value and capitalistic uh, value uh, for this, this work that we do as trained intellectuals and scholars. Um, and the project in the DA, I want to say, has uh, given rise to um, a multivocality um, where we have um, gone away written individually and shared these short pieces, these writings with one another, uh, where we speak each other's 
uh, actually perform each other's text as an oral presentation uh, anonymously, so not knowing what each other has written. Um, and we have also um, guarded against uh, uh, racing towards the publication of this work. Um, and we've guarded against that because we want to do it in a way uh, where we're not, um, I suppose, ambushed by the kind of competitive uh, and rather individualistic uh, 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 dynamics of working in higher education settings. Um, the other collective practice that I want to share with you is uh, Deborah already mentioned the work of Bark, the Bark Collective. And here, um, the Bark Collective is again a collective. It is, it is a, a explicitly a collective where um, we, I think, have um, informed our writing uh, uh, through practice, through the generation of practice. And it's primarily an organization, a collective committed to development of pedagogic practices through um, um, creating uh, anti-racist spaces. Uh, and what we mean by that, and Deborah would be able to, to say some more as well, because she's also part of that collective, um, is to think about the relationship between knowledge and affect, and to create spaces where affect and the way we relate, relate to each other uh, is transformed temporarily in a more uh, uh, leveled, and a more pluriversal uh, 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 context. Um, and I want to just finish with um, talking about a caveat that comes with collective work, collaborative work, and doing decolonizing work with colleagues. And that caveat is that um, I, I believe that in scholarly communities, uh, we are, uh, we hope for, we wish for, we move towards consensus. We move towards spaces where we are understood and in which we are recognized. And these are important. Mm. However, the caveat that comes with that mm. is the need for consensus. Mm. And mm. the need for consensus, mm. I think, can undermine the importance of the pluriversal the need for dissensus, the need for fracture, the need for us to be held accountable to those sharp edges of our bodies and histories mm -hmm. that are important differences, as Audrey Lord would say, we must be recognized and worked with uh, mm -hmm. and not ignored or glossed over. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'd like to finish. That's really wonderful. Thank you, Sadri. And thank you for getting us off on such a strong foot with such a, such a rich plethora of ideas to get our teeth into. Um, I can see that some uh, people have been posting comments and reflections on the Padlet already. So um, you can have a look there uh, as we go along. Our next speaker is Dr. Hadiza Kere Abdulrahman um, from Bishop Gros Grossetesta University. I hope that's right. <laughs> Hadiza is interested in the way that colonialism and coloniality has an effect on shaping the narratives that describe the system and education in general, as well as the hidden curriculum that exists in the form of education and socialization. She explores how coloniality of knowledge, power and being shapes who we are as people, especially how we come to know the things that we know. As a lecturer in inclusive education, she seeks to make a case for inclusivity in the wider sense of the term and in a way that acknowledges its contextual variations. I'll hand over to you, Hadiza. I must remember to unmute myself. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and um, thank you so much for convening this really amazing um, seminars I've caught to and um, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you very much, Dr. Dara, for your, for your presentation. That kind of really allows me to start with mine. I've got slides where the slides are just a guide for me and I know I have only 10 minutes. <laughs> I've got 15. So I'm going to try and get through it as quickly as I can. It's a shame that I, I won't be able to move things along, but um, if you just, so this is the title. I have had to 
have a title just to kind of constrain myself. Um, the way I'm going to be making sense of representation today is through my work, my doctoral thesis, so how I came into it. But I'll be drawing a lot from the work of Stuart Hall, who uses Foucault. So I only make sense of Foucault through Stuart Hall. That's my limit of Foucault. Um, but, so I'm going to be looking at the intersection between representational discourses and how the, the, the complex interplay with what becomes knowledge and, and power. So that's what I'm trying to, to get us to think about. I've got some notes only because I'd like to refer to them. So if you see me looking, I'm referring to my notes. So today's um, topic is post-colonial misrepresentations, dominant discourses, knowledge and identity. And I've got miss there because if we just take it as representation, we forget how powerful it can be or the potential to misrepresent. So whenever you see a representation, always think about the possibility that it might be misrepresenting is really what I'm trying to say. Next one, please. Next slide, yeah. This, no, uh, I think we've missed one. This is just um, some of the things I do. Like I said, I'll be drawing from previous research uh, on an alternative knowledge system in Northern Nigeria. I won't be talking much about it. If you find me online, you'd find I've talked about it so much. I've just put it there because that's where I'm drawing my, that's where I'm theorizing from. I'm not theorizing in a void. I'm theorizing from what I've seen on the ground. I'm, a, I'm what you would call a decolonial, postcolonial scholar. You have to be careful with labels. But what that means is that these are the lenses with which I, analyze everything I come across. I kind of think about my positionality. I kind of think about the baggage of colonialism and what it has done to who I am, to how I know things, to how I encounter things. So that's what I mean by a post-colonial, the colonial lens. Next, please. I'm gonna just limit that. Um, so in post-colonial scholarship, representation is not new in any sense shape or form. Um, most of, much of post-colonial scholarship is actually informed in one way or the other by the theories that elucidate this politics of representation. So if you think Edward Said with his seminal piece, Orientalism, how the West was able to um, produce the Orient politically, sociologically, ideologically, imaginatively, how it pervades what we write. This is very much central to post-colonial scholarship. Think about Gayatri Spivak and Candy of Alton speak, how um, Underlying, underlining how representation of marginalized groups are intimately linked to positioning. As postdoctoral scholars, as doctoral scholars, I think that's what I want to tease out. Our positioning is really important in how we make sense of culture. Um, Hall, to give a brief definition of what we mean by representation, says it's how we give things meaning. He says it's the process by which a, mem uh, a group would give language or produce meaning. And I think that's important, that it's not a neutral act, that where you draw this comes from a conceptual map. It comes from what informs your prior learning. So post-colonial scholarship or studies is useful for critically analyzing representations, especially those that are the other. It's about how we create a group different to, to ourselves for various reasons, to make ourselves feel more superior, to bring down another group. And as researchers, I think that's something that we need to go into research with the awareness of. What are we doing and how are we doing what we're doing? Next, please. So the question of representation, like I said before, we give things meaning by how we represent them. It's not an innocent act, it's very political, it's very heavy, it's almost strategic. What Foucault might call a discursive formation, it has a target. So whatever you see, it's not innocent. It's actually geared towards something, even for you as a scholar. What you write has a meaning behind it. What I'm trying to do today is to make sure that we unveil that people make sense of the world they live in through the act of naming, through representational forms, and that's what makes them far from neutral. The politics of representation revolves around issues of power and control over oneself and its representation and product reproduction by others. And that's why othering comes into it. That's why a dominant group would position themselves different from another to assert their superiority, either politically, either economically, in whatever shape or form. Next, please. So what's my particular stance on representation? I went into my research um, 
I did a literature review and everything I was reading about my particular study or topic of study was the same. It was all the same. What constituted the knowledge on this alternative system of education was all the same. And I thought, nah, something can't be right here. What is happening here? Where is this knowledge coming from? Why are they all the same? And then I realized what Bagele, Chilisa Bagele says, that it's that awareness of deficit theorizing. When you go into a field of study and it's theorized from a deficit, then you have to be careful what's happening because dominant languages, dominant knowledge systems in Nigeria, where I come from, particularly what we call Western education, which is seen as modern and progressive, are implicated in the construction of knowledge. Discourses, in this case, representational discourses can govern the way something can be talked about. It can put a ring around it. If something becomes established as eighth truth, then it's different. It's very difficult to make an alternative case for it. It's especially difficult for members of that group to make a claim for the validity of whatever it is that they're doing. So when I talk about Almagerenti, people say, oh, you're romanticizing the system. You're, you're, you're giving excuses. That's because what has become the knowledge, the embodied knowledge or the constitutive knowledge of Almagerenti in Nigeria is a particular way. They are seen as a problem group. So when you make a claim for something different, people don't believe it. That's the work of representation. It has the ability to, to become the truth. And then you have to work harder to say, no, this is actually a misrepresentation. So I heeded Smith, who invites us to problematize research and doing research as a significant site of struggle between the various interests of knowing. So knowing for me, knowing for my participants, knowing for my readers, whose interest am I pushing forward? And what is the agenda behind it? And you might think, how is this related to representation? If in your thesis that you're eventually going to write is a piece of representation, images, cultural artifacts, speech, discourse, everything becomes representation eventually. Next, please. Um, so this is about Alma Jorenshi. Like I said, I'm not going to go into it. You can find so much about it. I'm going to leave my email. You can send it to me. But it's basically a system common all over Muslim West Africa and boys are set up to study the Quran and live with a teacher. Now, what happens is that they, they, become a, they become street children sometimes, and it's a huge social concern. In Nigeria, particularly, there are 10 million boys in this system. That's what makes it big. Next, please. This is a common image of Almajor. And you remember when I said I'm careful about images because these images can exist or can be encountered only through our superior gazes. And that's why imagery is really important. We look at it and we're like, oh gosh, what's happening here? They're begging. Yeah, the boys end up on the streets begging. But if you're not careful, if you see this enough, the boys register in your consciousness only as beggars. Um, we give things meaning by how we represent it. So whenever I have used images of al begging, I have had to use a counter image, which is on the next slide. This is a child copying from the Quran. This is how they want to be seen as scholars. The begging is by the way, that's not the entirety of who they are. But Nigeria, Western education Nigerians will have you believe that that's all they do, the begging. But what they're saying is no, a begging is as a, the begging is as a result of this unequal society that we live in. This is who we are. Next, please. So what I did was I looked at how knowledge can be produced through this course, in this case, the representational discourses. I paid attention to how they are cultural texts rather than a single reality. Yes, it just, who, 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 whatever becomes trumped as ideal depends on the power that is backing it. This is the knowledge as power discourse that I was talking about. And one of the things I realized quickly was it wasn't just enough to get stories from my participants. I had to find a way to contextualize it against the representation of the school. So if you say, this is who I am, I use their stories as a counter narrative. This is what I want to get through. When you're representing, it's very important to be multivocal, to bring in different voices, to decenter what has always been centered. If this particular way has always been seen as credible because researchers like me have said, this is how it is, this is the truth. Our job is to bring in other voices to decenter ourselves from the process of representing. 
Next, please. So these are examples of the discourses. I've broken them down into three. I'm not gonna go into it because I don't have time. Deborah only gave me 10 minutes. <laughs> That's not enough for me. I can, yeah. So um, these are some of them. And there are even more emotive languages like this. They've been called scars on the face of Nigeria. They've been called reservoirs of disease. They've been called a menace. These are languages that I use to describe people. And the more you listen to it, the more you forget that they're people. So recently, a state in Nigeria has banned the whole practice. They just go in the middle of the night with guns and pack the boys from their hostels because they are seen as miscreants, because they are seen as beggars. So something in their head that a ban would fix without realizing that there are people in it. That's how representation can have real time effect if you're not careful. Next, please. I love Stuart Hall. I don't know if it's possible to call myself a Hallian. But that's what I, I, I love the work of Stuart Hall because finding him and his works of representation was just fantastic. It just completely made sense. I have only two minutes. Hopefully I should be able to do it. It completely made sense. So I use this by the Birmingham Cultural Studies Group to, I use their circuit of culture, both as a conceptual tool and as a discursive and analytical tool. And it's very fascinating. Like I said, I can provide back information for you if you wanted to find out more about how this works and how potentially it can fit into whatever it is you're doing. So what it says here, if you see, look at the five points of articulation, is how they feed into each other, is how they connect with each other. So who produces these discourses or representational discourses? People like me, academics, media, newspaper, imagery, yeah? Who consumes it? People who have access to that, yes? So if you keep showing pictures of young boys as beggars and a lawmaker or a policymaker sees it enough, he thinks you can solve the problem by banning it. That's where it feeds into reg reg regulation. It becomes rule, right? Eventually they become established in your head as beggars and then they take on that identity, at least to you. So this is how the circuit works in a nutshell. Next, please. So what am I saying? <laughs> because I have to remember, I'm talking, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still ECR and I'm talking to people who are probably still writing. Um, I always bring us back that as scholars, we must really be aware of some things. The first one is we must be aware of the tendency to speak for, yes? We feel like because we're doing this and all of a sudden it's getting to our head, the power inherent in doing something like this. And like um, Dr. Sadri said, we become implicated in the, in the power structures <laughs> in the academy, yeah? We feel like that gives us some credibility. Now I've got a doctor in front of my name so I can speak for people. We must be really aware of the responsibility of that. And even almost the fallacy of speaking for and especially of speaking about. There's so much in that because all that eventually goes into representation, even in the way that you're not aware. So we must be scrupulous in there both, especially in the case of unequal relationships of power. Whether we like it or not, because we are researchers, we have a lot of power, we set the agenda. You know what questions you're going to ask. You know how you're going to analyze that, that data. You know what you're going to try to make prominent and that would eventually become that. You have to be conscious of the way that power enters into the process of cultural translation because you're translating culture. Even if I'm from Northern Nigeria and I've seen this, I'm still putting English words for things that they have told me in Hausa. It might get lost in the translation and it might become representation. Next, please. So these are some of the ways that you can do it. Just constantly remember to be respectful and ethical, challenge pathological descriptions. You must challenge these descriptions so that you create a body that, of knowledge that carries hope, that promotes transformation and social change. These are four hours. I love them. Every presentation, I think I've carried them along with me because I think they're so important. Respectful representation. Would they, if the person you're talking about reads it, would he feel happy? Or do you have to hide it from them after writing it? Next, please. Yeah, yeah, I think I did it. <laughs> um, so yeah, 
There's a need to recognize our responsibilities and accountabilities as researchers in light of impact on social life. It's important that we remember that however we proceed and whatever way we proceed, we'll be changing the patterning of social life. And you'll be thinking how, I'm just a researcher. And what I can tell you is that in the time I've been doing this, I'm amazed at how I see someone else's work or I watch some, what someone else is doing and I hear my words in that. I'm beginning to see this pushback appear in what people are saying about Almajire. Now imagine if I had just done things the same way everyone else has. We will continue to perpetuate that knowledge, that representation, and it will become established as the truth about Almajire. So however way you proceed, remember the responsibility of representation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hadiza. And um, <laughs> I could see you wanting to pack more into the 10 minutes. I wish I could have given you more time. <laughs> um, I could, I could, uh, there's so much, and I, I'm quite happy to share whatever I've got a lot. I, I was telling Ziba, I, I practiced yesterday and I had 16 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, hopefully we have, we'll have more time when we all come back together as well to unpack these things and people will pick up on things, things you've introduced. Um, so next, uh, as a speaker, we have Dr. Gemma Sue, who's based at uh, RMIT, M -R -M -I -T, uh, University in Melbourne. Gemma researches representations of human vulnerability and lived experience of people affected by disasters, predominantly in the Caribbean. She regularly collaborates with artists to communicate her research in engaging, thoughtful and socially responsible ways. Now, Gemma is going to be joining us by video and we're going to share the video, I think, from Angeline's screen. But I'm also going to post the direct link into the chat if that's a better way of watching for people. It may be better with the, your Internet connection. So see how you do through the shared screen. And if it doesn't work, you can click through and then rejoin us in, in 10 minutes time. Hello everybody, my name is Gemma Sue and I'm based at the RMIT University in Melbourne. My research looks at the everyday experience of people affected by disasters, particularly in the Caribbean. Um, I'm really sorry I can't be with you live today, but I'm stuck in a uh, hotel quarantine in Australia, um, so the, the time difference was just a bit too much. Anyway, I'm really happy to be talking to you today. Uh, this is something that I'm genuinely really interested in is decolonizing research by the way that we write, disseminate our findings. So what I want to talk about today is comics. So I created a comic from my research. Um, the research was about how families recover from, recovered from a hurricane that impacted Puerto Rico in 2017. And I followed the same 20 families for a year visiting five times and from this I created a comic. So you might be interested in creating a comic yourself or other outputs such as poetry or photography or film. Um, I still think that this is, it's, it'll be useful for those thinking through the different issues because different each medium has their own narrative storytelling format or different technological form. So They'll tell stories, they'll communicate with fires in different ways. So this is specific to comic, but some of the broader um, issues are also applicable to different uh, mediums. So comics is something that I've always been interested in, particularly graphic novels, because they are not just for kids, they're not just about um, goodies and baddies, they are very subversive, they have um, serious comics, have the um, grounding in 60s, 70s, politically left underground movements in New York and San Francisco. And they have massive storytelling power. They can um, distill complex ideas into really engaging formats. And I'm gonna be talking through three particular ideas. So democratic research processes, representational politics, and the ability to go to intimate, overlooked, mundane moments in your research. Okay, so the first point I want to think about is the process of creating comics. I worked with an illustrator and after each visit, I'd write a storyboard, he'd sketch it up and I'd take that 
those sketches to the family on the next visit and say, what do you think? It, that was, for me, it was, it was brilliant. The amount of feedback I got from families was great. I got the sense that people felt a lot more comfortable giving their opinion when they could literally see the story. They could say, the house doesn't look right, or we wouldn't say that, talking about the dialogue. So that ability to bring in um, your research participants in a more collaborative way, in a more participatory way, which is something that's debated in the decolonization uh, debate, it was really uh, central for me. So when people can literally see their stories, not only something ethical in that, and that people get to see what you produce, it's not just lost in a journal article, but having to in be part of the process of telling those stories that will be put out to the public. Um, which again isn't something you, you often get with journals through that academic jargon, theoretical obfuscation. So that can be a real barrier for people feeling that they can say how their story could be told. Also comics, because they rely on visual storytelling or visual literacy, they are engaging or um, can be accessed, the story can be accessed and understood by everyone. You don't have to be, you know, an academic boffin to, to read a comic. And they don't rely on text, it's very visual. So, for example, in the image here, this is the morning after the hurricane had passed. You see slumped shoulders, sad faces, people embracing. You also see um, people are small in the image and there's a wide lens uh, or bird's eye view. Just all of that captures the enormity of the problem that people face and the feelings of like um, being overwhelmed and, and sad basically. So you don't need, I don't need to shove that in people's faces with some dialogue saying, I feel really sad. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be didactic. You can allow the reader to unpack it themselves. And the idea of being able to print a comic um, and give it to your research participants, something inherently le legitimate about that or ethical about that, rather than a journal or even an online comic being lost in the wilds of the, of the internet. Okay, second point, the idea of representation. So in disasters, you often hear it in the media, people are really helpless, there's raw suffering, they're destitute, images of people crying, um, death, uh, destruction, etc. And to a lesser extent in academic work, you often have what Eve Tuck calls damage-centered research, where you just, people are represented as depleted, ruined and hopeless as she says. So that really takes away the agency of people or um, reduces them to a mere victim of disaster. But with comics, the, the culture of storytelling centers on, on personalities, on individuals. So you get to create these really three-dimensional characters who are not homogenized as disaster victims, but you see that they have humor, energy, they can be serious, funny, um, they have their own uh, different style, um, they have their own different ways of speaking. So again, you move away from um, reductive, simplistic, one-dimensional representation of, of people. And so it's showing people as more complex human beings. And Tuck calls this a more desire-based uh, type of research, where you show the, 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 the ingenuity of people. But, you know, there's uh, caution there. Um, we don't want to start romanticizing people, um, which a lot of research can do, say, when we focus on people's agency or capacity. There's a tendency to overlook structure and um, broader social problems that are barriers for people. So that's something I wanted to make sure I represented it in the, in the comic. And you can just see in the bottom right here when um, Natalia refers to the local government just forgetting about them really. You could use your understanding of neoliberal environmental politics to unpack that and go, oh yeah, it's, it, it's theory's not spelled out there, but I know that what the comics are getting at here is that people are marginalized, people are left to fend for themselves. Um, so again, you're, you're relying on the agency or the involvement of the reader to unpack the story. 
Third point is something I found really exciting about comic is that they allow you to go to places and moments of your research findings that um, you often don't represent in journal articles or you can't capture in other visual mediums such as photography or film. So they allow you to center on people's stories which are often marginalized and again that's something that's debated in the decolonization debates is, is centering on, on people's stories that are often overlooked but, but what people might find important to them. So for example say you use photography or film as one of your visual methods it's unlikely, unless you get the, the film from families who've been affected by a disaster in this particular case, that you would be able to represent visually the moment that the hurricane passed over the house, which is what the bird box is about. So you go into these experiences that we often don't, don't see, um, but you can recreate that through illustration. Another example here, which is something that um, a couple of um, interviewees talked about is that after the disaster people were living with each other temporarily in the living rooms matches in the living rooms so people really lacked privacy so the couples who wanted to be intimate with each other but they couldn't and again this is a very mundane everyday thing but um, you can represent that in, in, through illustration and i imagine you know it'd be very unusual if you could represent that moment with a video or um, photography. So again, this is the the, uh, the flexibility of the illustration, where, where you can go, where you can access through them. So that's very, very quick, but just really wanted to say that, think about the, the democratic process, the representational politics, and the places that you can go um, in comics, which I think speak to this decolonization debate. You can think about this in other mediums such as poetry or VR or photography um, if you're interested in those. But for me personally, I found the process of making comic really challenging but really exciting and it allowed me to think through and start challenging some of the problems that I find in academic, academic writing or text-based writing such as journals and, and books. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that and um, hope you're having a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much, Gemma. I know you can't hear me, hear me in real time, but you might see this on video. Thank you very much um, for introducing a really kind of innovative and something certainly that I've never tried um, method of communicating research. Excellent. Do we think we have most people back now? Everyone back? Brilliant. Oh, I'm really glad. Yeah, fabulous. Share away in the chat. I'm ha having some trouble reloading my Padlet. I don't know about anyone else. Um, I think a few people are. So please do share in the chat. We will get started. Um, oh, I'm going to make sure we've got our speakers back first, though. Here's Sadvi. I can see there's Lakshmi. I'm scanning through. Hadiza, are you there? Yes. Excellent. Um, we'll get started from some of the questions that we uh, I can see were shared earlier on the Padlet because um, we've got a backup. Um, and then open it up for sharing from questions from the breakout rooms. Please do feel free to post in the chat and Zebra and Suzanne will keep a lookout or I'll invite people to turn their um, microphones on and ask questions as well. So uh, a practical question to start with and perhaps um, I could invite Hadiza to, to respond about multivocality, a lot of people like this question. Do you have any advice for building a multivocal text slash a text that represents pluriversality? Um, so when I think of um, multivocal, I'm just thinking in terms of many voices. And it's in little ways. I was just telling in the breakout room how my participants didn't want to be anonymous. So in my thesis, their pictures are there, their details are there. We have composite descriptions that we both came up with the way in the way that they wanted me to to show who they were to the world and i thought that was really important and um what i've done and some times when i've um talked about alma to nigerians is i invite my participants along you don't have to hear me say it they can talk for themselves if you just allow so we if you are willing to listen so it's not a question of them having no voice it's you not listening 
So for me, multivocal is about different people being, it, it's linked with decentering. So I get to a stage when I think you need to shut up Hadiza. You've opened the gates for people to talk, to listen, because like I always say, I have a freaking DR in front of my name so people would listen. But soon as you get, just quietly move to the side and allow them to speak when possible. So that for me is what it means is that whatever you're doing, even yesterday. So before any presentation where I, I, I go back and touch in with what's happening, what has changed? Is it still the same? Is there anything I should be aware of? Can you come in in any way? Do you want to come in? That's important. Don't just assume that the, the approval they gave years before still holds. They might no longer want to work with you. But I was saying in the breakout room that it's about accountability long after the research is over. It's all intertwined. I, I, am, I try to embody the decolonial. So it's in little acts. So multivocal for me is just the centering, bringing in the different voices, especially of the participants. Mm. And, and we've got a, um, a question that relates to that as well that was um, quite popular in, in the Padlet around practices and like little practices. And I wonder, um, Lakshmi, you kind of started to talk about this in, in your presentation. So maybe we we'll go to you first. But the question was, what practices can we engage with, with to reckon with our own embeddedness in the colonial academy? Um, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I mean, it's an ongoing answer. Don't know if there's ever one. Um, we've had the discussion a lot. Some people say dismantling the institution as it stands is um, the only way forward, considering its historical legacy. Um, for me, I think it's about relationships. So I kind of take that Arendtian approach that politics is all about the space between people. So I think if you can change the nature of those spaces and your relationships one-on-one uh, -on -one and then build your way up to your institutional relationships. And obviously that just means simple things like imbuing them with respect, a horizontal behavior, sort of a collegial scholarship. I think that changes um, enormous amounts, even if it's just sort of step-by-step. -step. Yeah, thank you. Um, do any of the other speakers want to chime in on that one as well? I can't see you all on my screen at the same time. So I'll rely on you just speak, speaking up at the time. Um, like relatedly, um, one thing that was raised in the Padlet was about careers and kind of careerism. Let me find it. It says, I witness every day people in academia benefiting from those who are marginalized. I see this outside of academia where careers are built on prof and profits made. How can this change? I wonder, Safi, if we can come to you. Yeah, how can this, I mean, thank you for that question. Uh, my response is, it's not a straightforward power dynamic. Uh, so what we're seeing now has a history and that history is a confrontational one where what we see in the mapping of it and the articulation of it from powerful institutions is one of, a very neat narrative and also a narrative around who's dominant and who's subversive. But I see the, um, the, the kind of the, the evidence of uh, folks continuously throwing sands in the gears, right? And I see that breadcrumb evidence in scholarship that has come out on uh, pamphlets, on conferences. These are, this is a historical uh, and ongoing long durée in which we're just a very insignificant part. I think overthrowing the system from a decolonizing perspective is the overarching aim. In practice, it is about the constant agitation, the constant nipping at the ankles, the consistent confrontation and agitation. And to do this collectively is why it's important because individually you become a target. Collectively, you share that, you take a break, you withdraw, you come together, you try to make sense of what's going on. But uh, yes, absolutely, the overarching aim has always been in decolonizing through that first engagement of the colonized and the colonizer, one of uh, uh, disruption, 
confrontation and doing all that you can with what you have to unsettle that narrative. Because that I think is incredibly important, the everyday lived decoloniality. Mm, thank you. Um, and perhaps building on that, we had a question about collective practices and, and maybe I can invite you to speak a bit more and then go to Lakshmi about her experiences. Um, like, what would you say have been the big challenges in working collectively, writing collaboratively? Is that too? Oh, Sadvi, that was for you, and then uh, I'll pass over to Lakshmi. The, the to. benefits of writing collaboratively, um, um, I think primarily it's about um, growing through. Um, provocative discussions. Um, I think there is an oversensitivity of doing this. Uh, we often like to be in a seminar space or a workshop space where we won't have that kind of confrontation. And I have to also say there's a gendered and racialized issue to this that, you know, women of color and black women will specifically be targeted in public spaces. Um, and in institutional spaces. Mm -hmm. And so doing the work collaborative, collaboratively and writing collaboratively mm -hmm. offers some safety, mm -hmm. but it also offers, I think, an opportunity mm -hmm. for, for that we to be dismantled a little bit um, and for us to just actually create texts or forms of knowledge, artwork, an archive that uh, is necessarily non-linear, not necessarily fractious. Um, and I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about also people who are working in institutions such as museums and other things about how that is a complicated thing to do because ultimately, um, in a scholarly setting, um, and, and I think Lakshmi brought this up really nicely, that the, the collective offers this kind of other space in a way that's non-institutional. Um, but I think in an institutionalized space, there is also collaborative work going on. Um, and I think the differences between those kinds of works are interesting to explore and make sense of. Mm. Lakshmi, did you want to build on, on that drawing from your experience, perhaps, of being part of a collective? Absolutely. I mean, I have significantly less experience, um, mind you, but so far over the last couple of years, um, one of the things we found is there's sort of a, in academia, there are these sort of like egocentric male cultures. And by writing together, like, man, you really have to face your own ego um, and the preciousness of your words and then get to the greater point of what you're trying to do. And we are interdisciplinary, those of us in the group. So you're often coming with different frameworks and those frameworks don't always fit neatly together. So um, there's a lot of moving and trying to, how do you keep, we keep relationships at the center of it. So if we don't agree on something, the most important thing is that the relationship stays healthy. And that's sort of our like combat against academia where you see people fall apart over writing projects and stuff like that. So for us, I guess that's the challenge. How do you keep a politics of friendship at the top of everything? And then how can you build down from that? And it is a lot of negotiation, at least for us, and learning to let go and learning, yeah, to give up your own ego or face it essentially as you try and do something that hopefully is a lot bigger than yourself and like, you know, which words you choose and that sort of thing. So I think it's a process. And I think even if I were doing this for 15 years, um, each time I would probably still learn something really valuable. Hmm. Um, it's interesting reflecting on the kind of negotiation of relationships as being such a big part of of, of collective activity um, and there's a question here that, that relates to relationships perhaps in in research more generally in negotiating that um, the question is called respectful representation and perhaps Hadiza could invite you to to respond to this one first um, this person asks what would we do as researchers if researching people and it emerges that they had engaged in abuses of power, racism, et cetera. In these instances, would you follow these practices of representing people in the ways that they would be happy with, um, with, with also calling attention to the things they may not want to be, um, for example, engaging in racist practices? 
That's a hard one, isn't it? Mm. I don't know that I have an answer. I'm just kind of thinking on my feet and it goes back to what did they give you consent for? Because that's, would they rescind consent if they knew how you'd write about them? Because it's everyone's right not to be centered in the way. So to, it's important that you're constantly honest so that they have a right to back out of it, to say, no, I don't want, and then you know you're doing it without them. For me, again, it's part of that being accountable. If you're working with someone, then you have to, on some level, have an agreement on both sides. I haven't encountered that, so I don't know what I would do, is my short answer, and I'm not going to blag my way through. I haven't thought about it. I would go back to my four hours and think about how it all fits in, because I use that a lot as a guide, not my four hours, Chilisa's four hours that I have put down there, and, and see where it maps into what you're doing in terms of um, respect for representation, reciprocality, and the rights of the research is the one I wanted to remember. What is the rights of those that you're working with? Because even a criminal has rights, right? So, um, or, or whatever, the, 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 the most awful person in the world has rights. And if you agree to work with them, then you need to respect those rights. I would, as a standard, and I'm lucky, I know I'm lucky coming into, into research late, have built a wide network of reciprocity. We're talking about working with others and I've been able to go with my conscience and not work with people with questionable ethics so far. Long may it continue. So I haven't had that challenge yet. Would anyone else like to respond to that issue? I think you're right. It's a really, really difficult one. Thank you to whoever asked it. I think that perhaps speaks to or highlights some of the frameworks we're working within, like time scales, the opportunity we have for dialogue and building relationships with people across time as well, to be able to have those kind of challenging relationships, which mean that conflict is productive. We don't often find ourselves in those situations, at least from, from, from my experiences. Um, Perhaps uh, there's a question here about conflict more generally in research then. There's one that says conflict of interest here that we had, which says, how can we develop decolonial knowledge for funded projects, i.e. sponsored projects? Um, I don't know if who would like to respond to this. Sadhvi, perhaps we could come to you. <laughs> or not if you prefer. No, that, can you just repeat that? Yeah, sure. It's about conflict of interest in funding for research. So how can we develop decolonial projects um, that are funded yeah, okay. and bid for money? Yeah, the acronym BAME, it seems to work a lot. Um, that that's basically goes to the heart of it, doesn't it? Because BAME, BME, these acronyms that are used to minoritize and standardize difference are precisely the language. Hadiza's like nodding, yes. Uh, it's the language, the structure through which our entire research design is legitimized by. Um, so here's the thing, isn't it? You're, you're in a, you are complicit. You are operating in an institutional space where funding and capital is channeled around what Hadiza talked about this discursive formation, right? Of who is your, who is the object of your study? What are the parameters of your research? Um, what, um, I think this is why Deb's not to ask me to talk about this because, because through our Bark Collective work, we did mobilize um, a kind of funding application strategy where we would go for funding to do uh, radical anti-racist work. Um, and we did, uh, we knew that if we used a certain political tenor in that proposal, it would be shot down immediately. Yet we knew that we did not have the resources to put something like this together. And we knew there are folks and communities of color hurting and precarious and quite alienated who we felt this, this, this situation needs some kind of intervention. And so we have used funding applications, uh, I think, to, to access funds using, um, as 
as sort of not uh, with, without um, undermining what we set out to do in those spaces to speak to some of the themes that are recognizable in those institutional spaces. I think Lakshmi talked about representation kind of being this kind of word that uh, is, is both something that can be recognizable, but also to help shift space uh, towards more radical work. But um, I also have to say, sorry, everyone, that I have to leave for another meeting now. But um, I just wanted to thank you all for this opportunity. I've loved uh, meeting the participants and the panelists and the curators. I'm indebted to you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Sadvi. It's always, <laughs> always a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, um, see you very soon and we will continue and you can catch up on video recording afterwards um Lakshmi I don't know if you would like to say a few words about that it was in your presentation that you were talking about using representation as a as a concept instead of um, decolonial in the work that you were doing um and there was a question on the padlet about that brings certain benefits in using that gaining access and so on but did you find also that there were some trades to be made um disadvantages to that approach uh absolutely and it's an ongoing conversation and yeah so it's a type of politics that you're practicing when you do that it's acceptability politics right so you're trying to get in the room by changing the language so that you're not offending those who hold positions of power but by doing so you're also in some ways diminishing the thrust of your argument um which for us we found at that particular time in case the trade-off was okay because we were able to get where we wanted but it's like as Sadvi said in the chat like collectives are temporary things so they have a point in which they're useful and there's a point in which you can see that that approach may not work anymore and again it's about timing so when we did this, this was like three years ago, three, four years ago. And so now the word decolonizing doesn't have the same rejecting impact. Now people are like throwing money at it because it makes you look good, corporate social responsibility, that sort of thing. Every institution wants to say they're decolonizing themselves. So, but then there'll be another word um, that will be more offensive that will come after that. So I think it's a constant negotiation of what you have to sacrifice in order to get what you want done. And it really, I think it's down to personal politics. So uh, David Graeber talks a lot about politics of exodus, um, which sometimes I find helpful as an approach where it's sometimes you step back as a group and you leave that institutional space because it's never gonna recognize what you're gonna do, but you need to keep it radical enough in order to shift the conversation. So if you go away, you can do something really radical and you don't have to filter your words. And then you'll find eventually people come and sort of changes and you're allowed to make that into a bigger conversation. So yeah, I would kind of go along his line of it's strategic, but I understand. And there were a lot of people that didn't necessarily agree with our approach. So I think, yeah, it's always something that needs to be talked about and as transparently as possible. Mm. Excellent kind of drawing attention to the context and being able to shift over time and in different spaces um, strategically. There's a related question um, here about uh, buzzwords and how some of the concepts that we use productively in, in our collective work in these sort of decolonial communities get kind of co-opted by organizations. Um, so the question is beyond buzzwords and acronyms, um, and Hadiza, maybe I could invite you to speak to this. How do we engage with decolonizing work in institutions that are founded on colonization? sexism, ableism, racism, and classism, places that use the buzzwords, but only on the surface, people in these places that resist because they are the benefactors. How do we get beyond these buzzwords? How do we, you know, combat people stealing our stuff? You guys, am I in a vibe or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, challenging I, really difficult questions um I don't know I, I again I don't know that I can answer that because I know that whatever answer I give comes from a position that is slightly privileged so if I stand here and say I subvert it has a different meaning if I stand here and say having read so, someone like Sarah Ahmed and then um, her politics of cultural politics of emotions and just really understanding what it means to be a black woman with a voice and a strong voice of that and the liberation and the strength it has given me. But I think and I don't have another word to use rather than allies. 
but it's just to kind of like find people on the same page first so test the waters and 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 i was telling in the breakout room how we're talking about race and class and how sometimes you should talk about class or you should talk about race and i say well i teach in lincoln i don't know if you've ever been to lincolnshire my first week at my university there wasn't one other person of color so my class is a white classroom and people get discomfited by talks of that by talk of race or other things that they're uncomfortable with so first week or so if i'm teaching my module on hidden inequalities i might start with class because i need people to understand the workings of power and the, and the ways that inequalities manifest. And then I go into race. It's a strategy. So you all need to have a strategy is what I'm saying. And it, it's different from context to context. So I've realized that in Nigeria now, perhaps I'm being too combative. Perhaps I need to carry people on my journey because I journey. So if you can tell, show what your journey is, you can get more people to come on it if they're on the same page with you. I don't know if that answers, but toolkit, that will change from context to context, depending on where you are. You can't use the same thing in every room. It won't work. Something that's definitely coming across is agility and being able to switch up strategy, depending on who we're, who we're talking to, where they're starting from and getting you to read other people super quickly. I mean, anyone who's in marginalized positionality, you get super good at reading other people very quickly um, in interactions. Um, I'd like to open the floor for this last few minutes to see if anyone would like to kind of put their mic on and um, ask a question directly. There's no pressure. I, I never know quite how, how long to leave it <laughs> before I go, well, in that case, I think I've left it. There's no one speaking up. Well, in that case, I, I do want to say a really big thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed the discussions. You've got access to the, the questions. Hopefully they reappear on Padlet at some point. Um, if you want to continue sharing some strategies in the chat in the last few minutes, please do. Otherwise, I'm going to hand over to Angeline to wrap up what is our initial series. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, well, Sasvi, who's left us, uh, Gemma, who, who um, uh, talked to us asynchronously, Lakshmi and Hadija for staying with us to the very end. Thank you very much. Those were four wonderful presentations. And, you know, you can see from the comments, people really appreciating how this helps them practically in terms of thinking about and planning how they can do their own research. Um, huge thanks also, Deborah, Suzanne and Zeba for convening, for finding the speakers and convening this session. Um, and I mean, I'm hugely grateful to everyone. It's been very much, it has been a collaborative effort pulling together this seminar series with different conveners. Um, and we started planning it collaboratively with a group of us from the different universities within the SWDTP, uh, kind of way back, I think in August. Um, so it's, it's um, great to see it come to an end. 